Okay, we're recording. Um, so Nietzsche nihilism, our lecture for today. Um, so today's lecture is gonna be a little bit different in style, um, not too terribly different, but uh, I'm employing a different strategy. I'll talk about that in a bit, but um, just quick overview of everything that, that we read for today. I tried to give you like the most famous passages uh, in Nietzsche, the most important ones that give you a sense of uh, the, the really huge points that uh, he was uh, talking about dealing with throughout his entire career. Uh, they come up in all sorts of different ways, the death of God, the problem of nihilism, the problem with scholars and uh, the will, the truth. Um, uh, and these are passages, the madman on redemption, on the vision and riddle, which we actually won't talk about at all. It's just in assigning Nietzsche, I felt the moral responsibility to assign that chapter because it is so cool. Um, time is a flat circle, stop dwarf, it's dope. Um, anyways, uh, what you read was some of the most famous Nietzsche that's out there. And also from Schopenhauer's educator, very uh, not well-read Nietzsche. So Schopenhauer's educator is really early Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche operating in a completely different intellectual period of his life, um, where he's just sort of starting out developing his style and his philosophical method. Um, and I think that the whole of Nietzsche can be understood through his uh, work in Schopenhauer's Educator and, and the Untimely Meditations, um, which is going to be an important feature of the different strategy for lecturing for today. Um, but that's just a brief overview. I, I thought it was important to give you like the big passages so that we could have a sense of Nietzsche generally. And then what I'm gonna do is run straight through all of Nietzsche to you know hopefully give you some grip on getting your own perspective of him. So um, before we do any of that, um, some housekeeping. So I don't know if you guys saw the email or announcement uh, I don't know if announcements, do announcements send you guys emails as well? Or do they just appear in the announcements like they do? Okay, cool. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do for discussion posts is after um, we watch the seventh seal, so during our off week, I'm gonna grade all of them uh, just so that the people who have done them have a sense of what their grade is at the half point of the semester. Just because I'm grading them doesn't mean you still can't or shouldn't post on them. I will go back and regrade them again uh, at the end of the semester, uh, so you can have an idea of your end of semester grades. But that way, I, I really only have to do it twice, and um, it still gives all of the students who are engaging on the discussion board, which is quite a lot. So, so thanks for doing that. It's, it's been really interesting reading and seeing y'all's discussions together. Um, so, so I'm going to go through and just give a number to all of the points that, that have been earned up to this point in the class, and then I'll do it again at the end so that you can see, and, and you know, it, it, they're not due. And just want to like help you guys get a sense of where you're at. Um, next week is the optional midterm. So remember, this class is all about choosing your own adventure to get an A. Um, you can, I mean, you all who are here or people in the future um, who have been attending class or some classes here and there uh, with cameras on or off or whatever it is, um, you've been earning points and maybe that you haven't been. I, I think I looked at it, it's like 75% of the course is shown up for at least some lectures, which is awesome. Um, that's exactly what I'd hoped for. And, and it looks really good so far. Um, you guys are uh, well on your way to doing really well in the class. So nice job so far. Um, if you haven't been regularly attending class, I really highly recommend you take the midterm. Um, it will only earn you points. It can't really hurt you. There's no way to actually really act, be that hurt in the course. Uh, the way that the grades will work I think, and I'll decide this as I like actually write up the, the exam. Um, but what I think I'll do is have it be every point over a 50 earns you um, 1% or something like that, right? So that uh, you have to not get a failing grade and then everything over your not failing grade is um, counted towards your, your end grade. So again, that's gonna be next week. Uh, the way my exams normally work is I give four prompts and these prompts are just like paragraphs full of questions about a topic. Um, and if we were in like a normal class, what I, what I would do is I would give you the list of four topics a week before the test. 
And then the day of the test, three of those topics would appear and you would choose to answer two of them. However, because this is an online class uh, and it's all open book, uh, I'm changing that a little bit. And because it's an optional midterm and um, uh, the, the stakes are a little bit different for grades in the class, what I'm gonna do is give you four prompts. I'm not gonna remove any of them and you have to answer three, right? So your grade is gonna be um, on how well you're able to answer those three prompts, um, which will be one on Camus, one on uh, Kierkegaard, one on Dostoevsky, and one on what we're gonna learn today in Nietzsche. Um, and again, that'll just be available for a week. So you have an entire week to go through and do it. I'll answer questions. Um, most of the prompts are not like fact-based. It's not like I can give the answer to you. So if you come asking questions, you're curious about a concept or an idea or, or some argument in the text, I'm happy to you know talk that through with you guys. Cause I mean, that's part of the learning process, right? Um, so uh, just don't plagiarize. That's really the only way to cheat and don't do it. Um, I will be unforgiving with plagiarism. Um, okay, uh, third point of business is I put together a Google form. It takes, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. So you go at your own pace. Um, form just to see like how you guys feel about the class so far. Um, what I've done in constructing this class and how I put it together is a bit experimental. Uh, and so I want to hear your feedback if you're willing to offer it. It can either be anonymous or you can put your name on it. But if you take the form I'll, or take the survey, I'll give you two bonus points. So a little bit of incentive to give some feedback. And, and it's not just the bonus points that, they're in, that, that will be the incentive, but um, this is feedback that uh, I will take into consideration in developing the rest of my lectures and how the course works and how I develop future courses. The, this survey is gonna be a little bit different from uh, the future like end of class survey. Um, yeah, let me see if I can copy this into the chat so that you can have it. Oh, oops, maybe I can't. Um, oops, hello. Oh dear, okay. Yeah, I'll copy this into the chat real quick. Um, I'll also email this around so that everybody has it. But so so the, the way that course evals work, uh, like the, the official ones, those live in my permanent record forever and ever. And what you say can determine whether or not uh, I become a successful academic with a real teaching job or not. And this is actually like no stakes just for you guys. And for me, um, nobody else looks at it uh, just to like help make your experience and your future students uh, better, right? It has no bearing professionally. Um, so uh, again, you can take it anonymously. If you take it anonymously, don't sign your name, but send me an email that you took it and just honor system, you know, I'll give you the points. Um, so please do that. Um, and next week is movie night. So next week's class is gonna be a little bit different. Um, we're not gonna have a lecture at 5 p.m. We're gonna have a lecture at 6.45 and it's not gonna be an, a, an actual lecture. I'll assume that starting at five, you start the movie and the link is in the syllabus. Um, you can just stream it for free wherever you can get an internet connection. Um, and I'm gonna show it here on this big giant TV uh, in our classroom. Uh, and I'll bring popcorn and, you know, hopefully it's a good time. And afterwards uh, at 6.45, I'll spin up a Zoom session and uh, we'll just chat about it, right? So I'm not gonna prep a lecture. I'm not gonna make slides. We'll just chat about the movie, what we thought of it, um, have it be like a really interactive class. And because this isn't a dedicated lecture, um, I'm only offering five points for showing up either in person or uh, uh, to the, the Zoom session. Um, but, you know, it, it, I mean, it's really low stakes and um, should be fun. And the movie is awesome. Ingmar Bergman is an amazing director and The Seventh Seal is um, one of his best. Uh, and it's hard to say what his best is. It may be impossible because there's so many good ones. But Seventh Seal is like uh, an existentialist epic, taking one of our uh, course textbooks, our novels or, or, or essays and turning it into a movie. It's fantastic. Uh, Night of Faith plays chess with death. It's cool. Um, so yeah, five points if you show up. I'll bring popcorn. Um, otherwise, be at the Zoom session 645 if you'd like to earn those five points. Um, any questions about housekeeping middle of the semester? We're, we're like right dead smack in the middle of things. So hopefully we feel comfortable about where we're at in the class. Um, but uh, before I move on, um, are there any questions or concerns or anything that uh, ought to be brought up? or solemn nods online? I just had a little question. Okay. 
for next week um the we 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 go to the zoom at six a little before 6 45 and it'll go on at that point mm -hmm. yeah because i'm going to start the movie at like 5 10 and it's 96 minutes and then i'll want like five minutes to touch my toes and walk around for a bit before starting um the the chat so i think 6 45 is a pretty safe cushion to, well and I, I i just was wondering in viewing uh the the bergman film is that he intended that to be the night of faith uh <laughs> in that context or i just wondered like as we're viewing it kind of what it, is that how we should be kind of approaching it as far as the class um mm. I mean, had I, he had I, he been here for Carden? Was it intentional, or do you think? <laughs> so I think that's something that we should talk about at six forty-five next week. Um, I don't think you would be wrong to interpret uh, uh, the main character as a knight of faith, but he also does have his own gripes with God, and um, and then reconciliation and it's, it's a very complex film there's a lot going on um but yes ingmar bergman was well read in everything that, that we uh have read and will read for uh the rest of this class so um all of those themes are heavily in play for this movie thank you thank you. cool okay so last week we looked at a christian response to the problem of being the problem that we've been talking about for our whole summer session so far um, this week, we're going to take one step backwards towards the French existentialist, right? So we started with Camus, and then we got a little bit more religious in Dostoevsky, very religious in Kierkegaard, and now we're uh, proclaiming that we killed God. Whoops. Um, so Nietzsche is not, strictly speaking, an existentialist, like our French existentialists that we're working up to, um, though he is atheist in a similar sort of fashion to, to them. Um, however, Nietzsche is a huge inspiration to basically all existentialist thought. So the the problems or at least the solutions the the uh the metaphilosophical method that nietzsche employs in uh allegory and poem and uh in literature and essay um all has a huge influence on on every existentialist author um and his whole project of value creation and meaning making etc um and the the uh authentic or, or correct best way, most noble way to use, to, to exercise one's will, um, again, also has a huge influence. So, so it's wrong to call Nietzsche an existentialist, but it would be wrong not to teach Nietzsche on an existentialism course. So where Kierkegaard considers what to do about the absurd, right? So um, there's this contradiction between the one and the universal, between uh, ethics and spirituality. Um, Nietzsche is concerned with a pervasive and problematic response to absurdity, which is nihilism, right? So the knight of infinite resignation who doesn't take that next movement of faith might be a complete nihilist, right? Because they've resigned themselves to everything and they're resigned to everything. Um, they uh, exercise no will in the world uh, and are without faith or hope or any solution. This is a problem. And it's it's a problem that uh, Nietzsche is incredibly concerned with throughout his entire career and sees nihilism not as just the, this direct, you know, like uh, uh, w the character in the Big Lebowski, the German guy like floats in the pool, right? Um, he's a nihilist, right? He's self-proclaimed at least. Um, that is an egregious, like it, it's a really dramatic example of nihilism. That's in part the kind of nihilism that Nietzsche is dealing with. But but Nietzsche is also really concerned with how we justify our nihilistic tendencies, our uh, response to the problem of being. We, we uh, determine that there is uh, a, a perfect good or uh, a pursuit of truth that uh, justifies all the rest. And, and this is going to be an issue for, for Nietzsche um, because these are just glossing overs, gl glossing overs, acts of glossing over. Uh, the um, base nihilism that lives deep down. Uh, and then what's worse is that we get these attitudes about us where we have glossed over uh, the uh, underlying truths of things and our nihilistic response to that uh, terrible, hard truth to fathom and swallow. And then we get all self-righteous and we think other people should be like we are. And if they're not, then... Uh, they're wrong and we're more, more, moreover offended because they're not like we are and, and 
um, differences between uh, these pursuits of, of truth and of power cause people to um, harm one another and, and themselves as well. Uh, and this is where you get all of this argument against Christianity and, and the, the priesthood. Uh, uh, Nietzsche may not have been uh, too much the enemy of Christ. Uh, he has a book called The Antichrist, uh, but um, there are a whole lot of interpretations of Nietzsche that make Jesus a pretty friendly character to Nietzsche. It's just everybody in the Pauline tradition that followed Christ that Nietzsche wasn't happy with, but we won't really get too deep into that. This isn't a class on Nietzsche. Um, it's a class on existentialism. So um, if there is no God through whom faith can resolve the issues of the, the problem of nihilism is this response, um, then new creative solutions are needed. And Kierkegaard here is saying, I'm going to do a leap of faith. And he just says, tell him to do a flip. <laughs> it's a very Nietzschean response. So who is Nietzsche? Born 1844, died 1900. Um, again, he lives with his mother. I think his father dies really young. Um, so he's just like in a mother, female only household. He has a sister. Um, he joins the army uh, at a young age, hits his head, gets discharged. Uh, he was the youngest full professor at age 24 uh, in at the University of Basel in the classics department, which is amazing. Like, like I'm 27 uh, and I'm not even close, right? I'm a decade away from being a full professor. Nietzsche at 24 is a full professor in the classics department at uh, the like premier university in Germany at the time. Um, and he, he chaired the department. He like was in charge of the whole department and he didn't want to be in the classics department. He wanted to be a philosopher and said, Basel, give me a, an appointment in the philosophy department. And they said, no, you're too good at classics. Uh, we want you in the classics department. Um, and we don't have much of what Nietzsche published or, or if we do, then it hasn't been translated into English. I think it's in his uh, libraries in Germany, but it, his classics work hasn't been all that well translated. Um, there is a book of lectures on the pre-Socratics that we have in our library. I checked it out um, a year or two ago uh, and read through it. His, his interpretations of say like Empedocles and Heracles are really cool and interesting. Um, it's fun to see the different like classics side of Nietzsche studying these ancient Greek dudes. Um, anyways, um, he was a friend of Wagner who built Bayreuth and wrote the, the ring cycle, right? So the, da, 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 the flight of the Valkyries, uh, German idealism and, and all this. Uh, during Nietzsche's early life, he was a huge friend of Wagner, uh, had a falling out later on um, and, and was at, at the point that he's writing Schopenhauer as, as educator is really inspired by Wagner. Wagner is a, an intellectual hero, a father figure to Nietzsche um, and their relationship is another really fascinating one. Um, worth looking into, uh, go on a Wikipedia binge. He was perpetually sick. So at the time, again, of reading or of writing the Untimely Meditations, he wasn't perpetually sick, but uh, he became uh, disenfranchised with the university uh, and with uh, what they wanted him to produce and what he was actually producing. And he got a whole lot of flack for uh, writing The Birth of Tragedy, his first book as a classics book, but it's really a book of philosophy and it's really a completely uh, wild, controversial interpretation of not just all of classics, but also the world. And uh, he was taken to task unjustifiably by uh, his peers. And uh, after this period, he struggles to like make a respectable academic name for himself, um, but isn't ever taken all that seriously. Uh, because he was so wild. And, and as he got older, he got sicker and sicker, sort of consumed by his, his work even, um, to the point where he was taking uh, sleep medication to be able to sleep, uh, which would uh, like ruin his stomach. And so he'd take this medication that kept him, it was like a, a version of Adderall or something um, that kept him awake and calmed his, his stomach, but then it made him unable to sleep. And so he's like taking all these drugs to like keep himself in stable balance and all the time, like writing like a madman. And uh, he was on sick leave from Basel uh, until he finally had his mental break. So Nietzsche at 44, I think is how old he was, uh, has a mental breakdown. Some think it was syphilis. That's probably not true. It's probably more likely a brain tumor. Um, 
And he'd been kind of weird for a couple of weeks leading up to his mental break. Uh, he had sent some very strange letters to like the, the Kaiser and a bunch of his friends, uh, just like insane schizoaffective stuff. Um, and eventually is walking through the streets of, I want to say like an Austrian town, but it might've been in the Swiss Alps that it happened. Um, he's walking through the streets of a town. He sees a horse get whipped to like move by uh, a police officer and breaks down, cries, grabs the horse, sobs, uh, and then doesn't speak again for the rest of his life, is silent. I think he, he would like mumble, like, you know, um, and wouldn't, but, but wouldn't like speak. He became like catatonic completely. Um, and there are videos of him in catatonia where he's just like his big bushy mustache is just staring. And he always had a mustache. He didn't have this mustache until he became catatonic. His sister, um, he, he wasn't famous. Nobody read his stuff until he became catatonic and his sister like turned him into a cult personality. So his sister is actually nefarious. Her husband, uh, she and her husband uh, were like proto-Nazis, right? So before the Nazi party, um, these were like the, the uh, she and, and her, her husband uh, were um, talking about like the Jewish problem and uh, were white supremacists. And I, I think for a while uh, they had gone to Argentina to create like a perfect Aryan colony um, and it failed and they came back. Anyways, um, his sister, in addition to being a proto-Nazi, was a public relations genius, right? So she makes Nietzsche out to be a mystery and she reorganizes his entire notebook, uh, which became the publication of Will to Power and rewrote a bunch of it uh, to make it uh, uh, consistent with her proto-Nazism and then like got that published. And so Nietzsche has like, at least in the early 20th century, a pretty bad rap, right? Because people are saying like, this guy like justified Nazism. It's not true. It was his sister's reinterpretation and redevelopment, her crafting of his image and his work to uh, fit that narrative. Now this is a double-edged sword, right? So it creates this Nazi misinterpretation of Nietzsche, um, which he was not and uh, did not like about his sister at all through their correspondence. Um, but it also made him popular and it got him read and it put him out into the, the zeitgeist. And, and so um, we have Nietzsche's sister, Nefarious, though she is to thank for uh, Nietzsche's uh, early prolif pro proliferousness. Probably the adjective, right? Proliferousness. So Nietzsche was a perspectivist. What does this mean? Um, well, first, Nietzsche is really tough to teach in a single day. How, how do you like teach a whole man's career in, in a single class? And I thought a lot about how to best like approach this because he is not only uh, has so many thoughts and every single one of his books has to do with every single problem under the sun, right? That they are all about everything. Um, so he's infinitely complex and his views do change throughout his life. Uh, different periods of sickness, of strength, of uh, academic influence, of uh, personal poetic influence uh, cause him to write in different ways, to employ different methodologies and to think different thoughts. Though all of his works do revolve around a series of uh, common themes. So what remains true, one of these themes is that Nietzsche saw nihilism as an awful problem in the world like I talked about in the introduction. Um, but he believed that there was a way that we could redeem ourselves from sickness, as he called it, or nihilism, um, through what he also calls life affirmation, or yes saying to life, which we're, we'll talk a lot about today. Um, he was a perspectivist, and he didn't believe in capital T truth, right? So rather than believing that there is some way that the world is true, right, essence preceding existence or whatever, um, Nietzsche was Heraclitean, meaning that everything was in flux for him. The cosmos is constantly changing, um, and the best that we can do in a state of constant chaos and change is to order that world through an interpretation, to bring the chaos of the world under the unity of a single interpretation that will allow us to affirm life in total, right? This is what life affirmation is. Um, and it's, it's through this that we end up uh, redeeming ourselves and living nobly with strength. 
Um, and there are better and worse interpretations, right? So some interpretations of the world uh, lead to more nihilism, sickness, resentment is uh, a big theme, um, and others lead to life affirmation. So how do you teach a philosopher for whom there's no true interpretation? How do you teach a philosopher for whom there's no truth? Like philosophy classically is the pursuit of truth, right? And that's the goal, right? Is to ask questions and get answers. But Nietzsche doesn't uh, ascribe to any sort of truth. And, and uh, it's like a bad word to atomize, right? For Nietzsche to say like, X is Y. Do you atomize X as Y? Um, it's, it's no good, you, you're, you, you've made a mistake because again, everything is in constant flux. So I thought a lot about how to do this and, and found it to be really challenging. So I, what I'll end up doing is very briefly running through these major themes in Nietzsche, the, the problem of nihilism, the death of God, um, the problem of uh, scholars and priests of Rizantamah. Um, and then I'll give you my perspective. And this is where the lecture is gonna be a little bit different. I'm not gonna be strictly teaching Nietzsche I'm gonna give you my straight shot all the way through Nietzsche. And so it's gonna take, the, the lecture is gonna take the form of an argument. And at the outset, I wanna say that this isn't the right way to read Nietzsche. This is my way of reading Nietzsche. Uh, and what I hope will come through the argument on the other end is not like, oh, I, now I know what Nietzsche meant and what he was saying, but rather enough texture to get a grip so that if you ever went back and read Nietzsche and studied him, that you would have the, but uh, at least one path through the, the mire and muck, the, the confusion and complexity that allows you to start ordering things for yourself. And I, I think that, that is, that's the, the strategy that I landed on when I was thinking about how to give a lecture on somebody that is very hard to teach, especially in say like an hour and a half or so. Um, so that's the goal, we'll see if it's successful or not. Um, but you know, just on the outside again, I'm not saying this is the right way, but it is a way and hopefully a helpful one. So the death of God and the problem of nihilism. We read this. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried. I will tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how could we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither are we moving away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as though through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? Gods too decompose. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. And in response, the people were silent and stared at the madman. I've come too early, he exclaims. Freaking awesome, right? So cool. Um, Drink up the sea and wipe the sponge horizon with a sponge. Super dope. That's just like lovely language. So, you know, like it's, it's edgy saying, you know, we killed God and that's revolutionary, um, but beautifully as well, right? Um, so what's going on in this passage? Well, um, if God is dead, well, it's, it's a question how we killed God. Um, we kill God by not believing in him. The, the madman is talking to a bunch of non-believers, a bunch of people who are scientists, who are scholars, who are uh, priests even, who uh, uh, believe they believe in God, but don't actually believe in God, right? They believe in the church, right? Think of the grand inquisitor here. Um, scholars who don't believe in God, they believe in truth, right? Like I just said, the goal of philosophy is to pursue truth. A um, bunch of scholars and priests and um Merchants who don't believe in God, they believe in making money, right? Um, and what the madman does is he says, look, realize this. Realize that you don't believe in God. Realize that by living the lives that you have, by being committed to what you're committed to, we've killed God. There is no more God to, to save us, to, to make up for uh, what we've done anymore. And uh, in this lack, right, um, do we not feel the breath of empty space? These questions, right, reckon with our the, the consequences of, of our lives. Um, and to reckon with them alone might be to be a nihilist, 
it's at least to be a nihilist to um, be asked and then not reckon at all, right? I've come too early. So in this class, I've called this attitude towards existential angst, anxiety, nausea, the problem of being. Without an essence or a God, how can we justify our existence? Are we not straying as though through an infinite nothing? Assent to this question without rebellion is nihilism, right? So to, to say, okay, I, I reckon with it, but screw it. That's to be a nihilist. Like I'm, I'm just resigned. Um, but to rebel against it is um, Camus' answer to how to deal with this problem, but probably also Nietzsche's as well in his own way. Um, it's to admit that we are actually plunging away from all the suns and that the only sounds we may hear are going to end up being the scrapes of earth dug up by the shovels of God's grave diggers, not the beautiful music that we could create um, if we uh, reckoned and answered these questions. So the people that the madman is speaking to aren't equipped to hear this cry. They consider the man mad and they remain silent. They can't fathom how to answer his question, maybe even how to hear it. Who knows if they've listened? So what's to be done to overcome the smell of divine decomposition, according to Nietzsche? What, what do we do to respond to this problem of nihilism? Well, facing the death of God, it would be easy to become hateful, ironic, cynical, scholarly, etc. cetera. Oh dear. Who is that? Hello, are you gone? Okay. So um, these practices, right, uh, assume some universal value in pursuit of action, self-righteousness, truth, will to X is, is the, the call here. But what's hard to face is the facts. It's hard to reckon with the, the, what Nietzsche calls the death of God, which may really just be a metaphor, right? It, I, it's easy to read him literally, say like, oh, we killed God and think he's you know, edge lord, supreme king, master 9,000, right? Um, and, and we've had some edgy sad boys writing to us throughout this class so far. If we read Nietzsche literally, he becomes like super master of it all. Now, I, I think it's probably just a metaphor for nihilism and, and the, the underlying emptiness of a world that is complete chaos without our interpreting it and recognizing, feeling responsible for uh, interpreting it in a way that um, is authentically justifiable, is, is affirmable. Um, so it's hard to face the facts. Everything is in motion and we're too smart for our own good. Rather than look at the challenging world about us, we make up our own answer and then forget about the problem, right? Um, but Nietzsche recommends that we become value creators in a specific sort of way. From within our perspectives, find that interpretation of life, of our life, or of life in general in total, um, that can make it valuable. So what is the principle of this unification is a question Nietzsche will ask over and over. How much of your life or life, capital L, in general can be unified under your created value? What sort of value should we create? And how do we do so responsibly? Nietzsche gives us good reason to think that there are a lot of values out there that have become very bad for us, like truth or uh, uh, spirituality or, or whatever, right? Um, there's all sorts of mistakes that we make, virtue, the good. Um, and he deals with this problem in geneal genealogy of morals and beyond good and evil, though beyond good and evil is entirely cryptic. Um, and so what happens by inventing a value that's no good for us uh, and then forgetting about the problems and being irresponsible to uh, the, the nihilistic tendencies that live at our hearts and the actual chaotic nature of, of the cosmos and of the world and of our existence in it is that we become what he calls inverse cripples, which we saw in the, the, the chapter on redemption from Thus Big Zarathustra. So Zarathustra says, I see and have seen what is worse and many things so vile that I do not want to speak of everything. And concerning some things, I do not even like to be silent, for there are human beings who lack everything, except one thing of which they have far too much. Human beings who are nothing but a big eye or a big mouth or a big belly or anything at all that is big. Inverse cripples, I call them. And now, just to contextualize, he's telling this to cripples. So like a hunchback and a bunch of people that are like lame or missing limbs or whatever. Um, and and this is important. Zarathustra is like recommending strength. He preaches value creation and be a strong individual. Don't give in to the weakness and, and come up with the fast, safe, easy answer to things. Um, do what is hard because that will be what makes you strong. And he's telling this to a bunch of physically weak people, but he, he says, look, you have physical weaknesses, but this 
is an opportunity for you to become stronger, that uh, in being blind, you hear better. Uh, in having a hunchback, uh, you see the world in a new curved way that, that gives you a perspective that others don't. And so you can turn what appears to be a physical weakness into a strength through interpretation, right? But these inverse cripples have gone too far, right? They, uh, they, they don't turn their weakness into a strength. So here's, here's an example of someone who isn't an inverse cripple, Plato. Plato talks about the forms, about uh, like, like the good or purple or the triangle, perfect concepts of things existing out in the world, like in, in a heaven of forms. Um, and Plato in real life was a super giant buff wrestling guy who beat up all of the other Greeks in all of Athens. Um, and Nietzsche says, it's no surprise that Plato, this super buff, strong guy um, of the world, philosophizes that the, the, what he talks about um, is completely distinct and divorced from the world. Plato, son of kings, right, um, of, of Athens and of Greece, uh, who has all the riches and the strength in the world to like control physically everything, um, balances out that physical strength with, uh, conceptual, uh, with a conceptual world of the forms, right? So we see this balance, right? Plato doesn't become someone with a big ear or a big belly or a big mouth. Um, he turns what is his hunchback, his strength and his worldliness uh, into a balanced interpretation that gives him a completeness. It allows him to affirm all of life, both the um, aesthetic, not the aesthetic, but the ascetic uh, conceptual forms and uh, the world and of being that he lives in, the strong, sort of powerful and rich one that he's in. Um, now this is to be, uh, that Plato is like the cripple in this way. And I think it's important that, that we read Zarathustra in speaking to the cripples in, in a positive way, um, in, a, in a way that, that makes the cripples out to be heroes, that they're only crippled in a negative sense if, if we interpret them as such, and they need not, right? Because they have other, so many other strengths that um, all they need to do is, is live by, value create, right? <clears throat> but the inverse cripple. And when I came out of my solitude, I did not believe my eyes. An ear, an ear as big as a man. I looked still more closely. And indeed, underneath the ear, there was something pitifully small and wretched and slender. And no doubt of it, the tremendous ear was attached to a small, thin stalk. But this stalk was a human being. And so saying that, that someone is an inverse cripple, this is a theme that comes up over and over. Uh, this is like the coolest expression of it. But what he's doing is he's taking scholars to task and scholars being academics and uh, like philosophy professors, the people that um, barred him from doing what he wanted to do in the university that um, made fun of him for thinking creatively and out of the box, et cetera. Uh, these people that uh, exhibit what he calls a will the truth over and above everything else, that what's more important is uh, determining uh, the, the tiny little feature of truth that uh, your dissertation and your career is all about. So say, for instance, I'm a formal epistemologist, and what I'm trying to do is uh, prove that some theorem is valid and uh, create an axiomatic system of logic that allows me to justify certain subjunctive claims. That's a highly specific, real uh, career that you can do. This sort of person would be a giant ear, an inverse cripple, someone who um, becomes crippled by uh, value creating and then fixating, right? On that value they've created such that they become ill, they turn into a giant ear or a giant set of lips or whatever it is. Um, they've turned what could have been a strength into a weakness by saying this is all that is and should be when it's not life affirming. You, you can't justify the whole of your life because you have been able to uh, make valid claims, valid subjunctive claim, or valid claims in a subjunctive mood using certain formal epistemological uh, uh, axioms. And it's silly. So this is the problem of inverse cripples. And this is, what, again, sort of the, where we gloss over annihilism by giving ourselves this mission, this purpose in, in life to, to be something or to live in a certain way, uh, forgetting to be genuine to ourselves and to the actual state of the world and um, rather just fixating and in fixation to cripple ourselves inversely. So inverse cripples are people who've committed themselves to one form of value and believe the value is an ultimate justification for their being. 
Scholars exemplify the will of truth and so become giant ears. Priests exemplify result to mob, self-righteousness, willful subjugation of others. Hedonists might be giant stomachs or lips or whatever. Uh, the moral of the story is just that values are not good for the sake of themselves. They're not good because they are values, right? Existence precedes essence. That's not going to be the case. Values are only good insofar as they are a byproduct of uh, willing the eternal return. So we need to learn what the eternal return is, which to will the eternal return is to affirm life, is to say yes to life. Okay. So what if some day or night a demon were to steal it after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy, every thought and sigh, everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you all in the same succession and sequence. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again, and you with it, speck of dust. How well disposed would you have become to yourself and how well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life? to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal. Again, super cool. Um, and if you read the Brothers Karamazov, you'll see Ivan in his loneliest loneliness being whispered to in his ear by a demon, uh, this thing and, and like the, the eternal recurrence. Um, and they like wrote these at the same time. So same idea in two different places. Dostoevsky dies right after Susan developed the thought, but it happens there. Um, Nietzsche's whole career is about life affirmation through the eternal occurrence. So there's some debate whether Nietzsche thought that the, this, whether or not this is a metaphysical or ontological doctrine, right? That the universe actually does recur. Um, it might just be a helpful tool to think that it does in order to get to the point where you can life affirm. Um, I'm of the opinion that it's not an ontological claim, but rather uh, uh, something of a pragmatic one. Um, and I think it's interesting too that it's a demon that whispers this to you, almost as if it's a temptation, right? That, that it's uh, something awful and evil that happens to you in your loneliest loneliness. Um, and and there, there are, so I said we weren't gonna talk about the vision and the riddle. There are some parallels between this and, and the dwarf who's riding on Zarathustra's back and um, Zarathustra recognizes the dwarf is there. Stop dwarf, get off me. And the dwarf says, time is a flat circle. And you read that and think, what the hell does that mean? Um, so, uh, this is the passage where the eternal occurrence is most clearly stated. It appears all throughout the rest of Nietzsche. We see a little bit of it in Schopenhauer's Educator. You see a ton of it in Thus Spake Zarathustra, um, but this is where it happens. Do you have a question, Glenn? Yeah, is this the, what was the Ouroboros that you talked about last time? Yeah. And so is that also the snake that you mentioned in the riddle as well? Like, is that a, hmm. a parallel to that? Maybe, you know, yeah. Like so it bites off its head, that's Yeah, so the, the whole thing is like a dream. Uh, and it, it followed that story follows dream logic. And, and I think it's, it's a really important passage. And I think it's, it's a wildly animatic and, and fascinating one. And yeah, you, you could interpret it as, as um, the, the farmer biting off the head of the snake uh, as um, breaking the eternal return. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. It, it again, dream logic and, and Nietzsche was, um, he's, he's a master of language. Uh, and and I, I think that it is important not to read Nietzsche too closely, but also to like read him close enough to get the feelings that he did. Um, in Eke Homo, he has this passage where he says, as I would write my, my works, Eke Homo is his autobiography right at the end of his life. Um, like as he was going crazy, he wrote Eke Homo to like re-explain all of his works and justify them and like give himself a coherent life story. And then he goes crazy, right? And that's it. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, the unbearable lightness of being. Abby mentions the unbearable lightness of being, touches on this concept. Yeah, um, what's his name? I can't remember the guy that, the, the name of the dude who wrote that book. It's an awesome book. Um, he was wildly inspired by Nietzsche. I mean, the whole book is, is Nietzschean. Um, he's taking a Nietzschean perspective of uh, life, love, and the uh, Czechoslovakian invasion. It's wonderful. Uh, the unbearable lightness of being, read it, it's great. Um, but yeah, the, the eternal recurrence, re re recurrence. What would it take? How well disposed would you have to be to yourself? How can we become so well disposed to ourselves so that we could crave the return eternally 
the turning of the hourglass, the returning of our lives over and over and over and over, right? Forever, right? How, how could we love ourselves, of our life, life in general, so much? How could we say yes to everything? And not just everything, but everything infinitely, universally, to make that kind of claim. Uh, what would we have to be? How would we do that at all? Um, because this is the answer to um, the problem of nihilism, right? So how does one respond to the demon of the night? Well, Nietzsche recommends all over his books, including Schopenhauer's Educators we read today, Zarathustra, that we say yes to life, we affirm it. And we have to have an interpretation under which it's possible to affirm all of life. Uh, that we can't just say, uh, I affirm this uh, axiomatic system for uh, uh, making valid certain claims in the subjunctive mood. That's not all of life. That's a really specific tiny part of my life. And if that's all that you can affirm, then you're a giant ear. You know, um, We got to be uh, strong, full-bodied things. We got to be like the hunchback who turns uh, his deformity into a strength or like Plato who turns uh, his uh, strength into a balanced out set of uh, opposing forces that you know make him world historically famous. Um, we have to become so well disposed to our lives and life overall that we can um, affirm life eternally. And how do we do this? Well, this is why I had you read Schopenhauer's Educator, because this is where I think that we get the answer. We need an educator and, and a specific kind of educator relationship in order to be able to affirm life, uh, to begin walking up the mountain that uh, whose peak is eternal life affirmation. So my take, what I've just been talking about for the last 30 minutes uh, is common themes in Nietzsche, things that you should just know and that are like really important to have in the background as we work through um, the rest of, of Nietzsche. Um, but from this point forward, I'm giving you an argument and it's my argument, right? It's my reading, my take, um, and again, hopefully this is like a way through the complexity so that you can have the tools that you need to tell your own stories, right? So if we must create value in order to will the eternal return and affirm life completely, we need help. We can't just do that uh, ex nihilo. You can't just, boop, okay, I, I, I affirm life, now what? Great. Um, who can help us? Well, educators, exemplars, heroes, the people that we look up to, the ones who teach us how to be good people, strong people, the people that we want to be that inspire us, right? So an exemplarist, and I'll define this term in a moment, reading of Nietzsche is very common, where what you're doing is you're seeking out exemplars and acting like them. Great people are examples for how to likewise be great. Um, and again, the, the exemplarist reading of Nietzsche is, is common, right? Because there, there are times when Nietzsche is a fan of Christ, because Christ set out on his own. He's a fan of the Buddha. He's a fan of... Uh, of uh, certain Greek athletes who uh, stood above all the rest of, of Plato. And then other times he scorns them uh, because they started traditions that all sorts of other people followed and, and like will to be like Plato, will to be like Christ. These are mistakes, will to be like the Buddha. Um, May I but, ask you a question? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It's just, there's so much building up that I need to clarify. Um, just, is it, is he kind of saying, uh, in the biblical uh, idea of do not trust in the arm of flesh, lean not to thy own understanding uh, kind of thing, that, that you err in, in thinking that it's enough, like in relying on one quality and thinking it's enough. And that, so in that way, being excellent in one narrow thing can be like a handicap. I'm sorry to simplify, to try to like- Yeah, no, you know, I think but, that's great. So he, he's basically- He's saying we have to be open to all of life and not get overconfident and have an ubris kind of thing where we're, we're, we're relying just on our excellence in one area and thinking that's enough that to live a good life, there has to be more of an openness and appreciation to all that might come our way sort of a little. Uh, yeah. So, so that's, that's a lot of the way there. Um, so, so, Again, there are better and worse interpretations of existence. Um, and you might misinterpret it. Okay, so in my opinion, you might misinterpret Nietzsche as thinking that the Ubermensch is interpreting all of the world so that whatever the world is all about is really good for me, 
right? You become uh, Jeff Bezos uh, squared, right? Um, I think this is a mistake. I don't think that's what the Ubermensch is all about. I think what the Ubermensch is all about is interpreting life in, in, in total, in, in sum, completely, so that it's not just like whatever is good, whatever comes our way is, is affirmable, but whatever comes at all in any way, everywhere, eternally, um, is affirmable. And so, so, so there's, there's a, a sense in which we uh, are, that the, the Ubermensch who, who is able to affirm life in this way, who is able to answer yes to the, the question that the demon asks, whispers in the ear in the lonely slowness, um, is, is without ego. Um, and, I, and I'll get to that at the end too. This is a part of my argument. Um, but again, there's all sorts of readings of Nietzsche that, that make it out to be like, will the power yourself to be super great and dope and don't care about anybody else, right? Just do, you do you, boo. And, uh, you know, as long as it's good for you, then great. And I think these are mistaken readings of Nietzsche. I think that um, Nietzsche wouldn't want us to read him that way. Um, so, so most of the way there, uh, I would say, Sarah, except for the fact that at least in, in my argument, I'm gonna argue that it's egoless, the, the life affirmation, uh, or semi-egoless in a strange kind of way. Um, but again, hey, just my mind, I just interject that, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of humility in it. It seems like there's a humility in, in recognizing that nothing that you develop alone is enough. It doesn't seem like it's, um, a sassy approach to your own strengths. Is that, Humility is, is, is definitely the wrong way to, to read Nietzsche. Nietzsche would like uh, be really unhappy with humility as a description here. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. It's and, and optimistic, it's, but it seems not, not like you're, um, uh, I don't know. It, to me, I guess kept thinking of that not trusting in the arm of flesh thing. Like that's not enough. Like it's not enough that seems humble in that way to say one anything that you do that is really great if you start believing it almost like like believing in fame believing other people's good reviews of you that that's it it seems optimistic in your ability to develop value but not optimistic in the sense of thinking that you're better than others maybe or that what you do might be just enough alone in one area I'm so, having a little trouble. I want to get this right. It, isn't there a kind of a humility in that, uh, an uh, optimism, but like you're not that great, not thinking that you're the the bee's knees <laughs> if you if you achieve one one excellent thing. Um. So so again, it, for for Nietzsche, uh, it is enough. Whatever you are is enough to affirm life eternally, um, and. Uh, one need only have the right interpretation that one creates right through the creation of value. And that's a, a personal project, but where like you step away from humility is, is in um, humility infers ego humility infers like I'm less than uh, or I'm uh, smaller than or, or uh, something to that effect. Um, none of that is the case in Nietzsche In Nietzsche it's, it's, we're all stepping up to, um, and it's, there's, there's a moment that, that, again, we'll talk about where as we step up to the point of the possible total life affirmation, um, it's as if the, the self that we are, um, isn't, is without ego completely. So, so by climbing these heights, by exhibiting our strength of interpretation and of, uh, world unification, um, we, sort of like transcending the ego transfigures itself into something that's very much not like an ego. Um, but, but it is through our own power, through our own strength that we, um, affirm life we're, we're affirming our life. Uh, but, um, maybe, maybe we should just move forward. And, uh, what was Nietzsche's Thank take you. on free will? Um, I, he doesn't talk about free will specifically. So that's an interesting question. I think he probably just assumes it. Um, but, I think that's an interesting question to dig through Nietzsche. So, so, so I'll, I'll 
leave it at that for now, Sarah, because there's a whole lot of other stuff that we got to work through to get like a full, complete answer. Um, Thank you. And, and again, that, that's kind of the goal of, of this argument that I'm going to give is because it's going to like shoot straight through to the end and uh, hopefully give you the tools to like, um, you know, come to your own interpretation. That, that's the hope. Okay. So if Nietzsche wants us to will the eternal return, then our best bet is to be like our heroes who are able to will the eternal return. Um, but I think this exemplarist reading of, of uh, Nietzsche is incomplete, and this is where I sort of start the, the argument for this lecture. So exemplarism is a branch of virtue ethics, uh, which just says in order to determine what counts as good or what counts as a virtue uh, or how to live, pick out exemplars and do as they do. So you want to be a good person, be like Nelson Mandela and, and Obama and, and, you know, whoever the heck is your hero out in the world, um, you know, uh, speak with the poise of Obama, uh, have the, the uh, compassionate composure of Nelson Mandela, uh, have the, the uh, intellectual capacities of Plato, whatever, you know, um, you pick your hero, they do things right, be like them, you'll do things right too, that's exemplarism, right, branch of virtue ethics. So for any typical exemplarist reading of Nietzsche, there are two conditions that a person must meet in order to count as an exemplar, or in the case of Schopenhauer's educator and educator. So educator is gonna be like a stand-in term for exemplar um, in the work that we read. So one is a practical condition. An educator is defined in terms of what they do, right? Do they do things well? What are they doing? And that practically makes defines them as what they are. There's also a constitutive condition. Uh, an educator is defined in terms of some features they possess which allowed them to perform acts set out by the practical condition. So uh, they are practically, uh, they're practically good because they uh, affirm life and they're constitutively exemplary because they have some quality in them that makes them able to uh, affirm life. Okay, so here's a quote uh, discussing the practical condition. To hang on to life madly and blindly with no higher aim than to hang on to it, not to know that or why one is being so heavily punished, but with the stupidity of a fearful desire, that is what it means to be an animal. Yet let us reflect. Where does the animal cease and the man begin? We usually fail to emerge out of our animality. We ourselves are the animals whose suffering seems to be so senseless. And yet there are moments when we realize this, then the clouds are rent asunder and we see that in common with all nature, we are pressing towards man as towards something that stands high above us. So this is what the exemplar does. Um, the foregoing quote describes what I call the twofold feeling, which defines the practical condition of a Nietzschean educator. They have to be someone who experiences this twofold feeling. So what is the twofold feeling? It consists in two feelings, surprise. One is the fearful animal in us, first half, the senseless suffering of these fearful animals. And the second is something that stands high above us. And in this moment of, of uh, perscipuity, of, of uh, insight, we are both aware of the fact of our suffering as senseless and animal-like, but also of this alternative height, this mountain air that, that we can reach up towards. We see ourselves as possibly able to get up there. So the twofold feeling, the content of the realization of a something standing high above us is twofold. First, we become aware of our shameful animal-like condition and, hello. Wow, that dog didn't wanna show up. Um, second, we become aware of the something uh, high above who is what we feel we must strive to be. So an educator is defined in terms of what they do. What do they do? Well, they inspire in us the twofold feeling, okay? So the importance of an educator, the importance of Schopenhauer as a character in Schopenhauer's educator for this essay is that he inspired this feeling in Nietzsche, right? And so educators like Schopenhauer will inspire the twofold feeling in the people they educate. Um, and I'm gonna pause here for just a second. Atticus says, I know we said he's not a Nazi, but I also have some concerns if he's like, we need to infirm and love anything and everything about life, which would include all the unsavory bits uh, like white supremacy and stuff. Um, yeah, so, so that is somewhat of a separate issue, um, but an important one. Um, so, so some people will so like Nietzsche scholars will double down and say, uh, if you have the right interpretation, then it makes it all good. Um, and uh, 
uh, some will say, well, uh, we can carve out the unsavory bits because those are like moments of resentment, sickness, and, and not good. And what an interpretation does is it brings together all of like the strengths of the world. It, it um, sees what is good as strong and, and you know, makes that case. So, so Atticus, you're totally right to, to bring up this uh, problem. Um, it is a hotly debated topic in the Nietzsche literature. Okay, so back to twofold feeling. Okay, so educators inspired us to full feeling, but according to an exemplarist reading of Nietzsche, educators or exemplars must also satisfy a constitutive condition. There has to be something about the educator that makes them able to um, give us the twofold feeling, right? And that makes sense that not everybody inspires a twofold feeling. There's a certain kind of person who is able to. Um, so educators are defined in, in future of uh, something they possess. Um, and here's Conant, James Conant, he's a, sec, a scholar of Nietzsche who um, writes about, uh, he, he gives an, an exemplarist reading of Nietzsche. He says, the exemplariness of an exemplar consists in its perspicacious realization of some possibility that in its perfect form is clearly recognizable as an excellence, an excellence to which other members of the genus can contain. So what is this saying? Well, it says, one, the educator is constituted so as, have, so as to have the ability to see potential excellences and say they're students. And second, the student has latently present some potential for future or a perfect form of their own excellence. So in order to inspire the twofold feeling, the constitutive condition right, is satisfied by um, both the educator being able to see in the student uh, something that the, the, the high heights that they can reach towards. And that student also has to have the potential to reach towards the high heights so that the educator can see it, right? So the educator therefore um, constitutively as an educator because they have the ability to see into students um, and see something that's constitutively great in them, the thing that stands high above us, um, and make the student aware of it. And this is what it would be to give the twofold feeling on a straight exemplarist reading of Nietzsche. But there's a problem. As uh, an exemplarist interpretation would have it, uh, educators interpret students to help develop those students' latent excellences. But what I'm going to argue is that Valley growth is a result of the student interpreting their educator rather than the other way around. So um, the, the twofold feeling is inspired by oneself rather than by an educator. But the role of the educator is still central in important ways. So why is the foregoing exemplarist interpretation schema problematic? Well, the second existential implication, the constitutive condition that we've talked about, um, says that there already latently exists some excellence. But Nietzsche did not think that the self stands high above us, has any content related to who we are in a pre-exemplary state, nor who we will be existentially upon realizing that state. He would be host hostile to such existential atomism. Again, this is to say that there's some kind of essence in us. There's a thing towards which we ought to strive. We have a soul. None of, this, none of these ideas are, are Nietzschean ideas, right? Um, uh, he, he wouldn't say that there is some thing that makes me me. Uh, and, and I've always been that and always will be that. And as long as I realize it, then I'm doing great. No, we, we make our own lives, right? Um, so that's a problem. So rather than thinking that the I that stands high above is an ideal form of oneself, a future form of oneself, a person's perfect nature crystallized though as of yet unrealized, the I high above is instead a mere instantiated realization that there is such a thing, that it's the... But as Kierkegaard might say, the actuality of a possibility as a possibility, not as an actuality or an essence in itself, something that, that like we will be, but rather the possibility that we can be something more than what we are now. Um, so Sarah asks, but isn't the value making idea aspirational and really not post facto justifying? Isn't the affirmation partly aimed at accepting life at face value and finding some way to realize some positive purpose or something in it? Um, Well, let's move forward. I think maybe when we start talking about artistic transfiguration, you might have an answer to your question, Sarah. Okay, so in describing what the self that stands high above is, Nietzsche says the following. What is, is the second half of the twofold feeling? He says, and so nature at last needs the saint, the exemplar, uh, in whom the ego is completely melted away and whose life 
of suffering is no longer felt as his own life. There are moments, and as it were, bright sparks of the fire of love in whose light we cease to understand the word I. There lies something beyond our being, which at these moments moves across into it. I think this is a beautiful passage. And this is where I get the, the as we get to the point of total life affirmation, if we were to become like our exemplars, our educators ourselves, and to reach those heights high above us, we step out of our animal suffering. We cease to recognize the word I, though we're still what we are. We were the ones that climbed up the mountain. Um, to us, it, it doesn't matter. There are only the bright sparks of the fire of love that pass through us. And, and it feels as if there's something else moving through us. And that is the affirmation of, of life eternally. So the something that passes through us is not characterized as an ideal me or you, some essence of who and what we are, but instead is so completely distinct from me as to render the very notion of self incomprehensible to cause us to cease to understand the word I, right? But if the I that stands high above is an existential state beyond or unrelated to like without ego or self, then it's unclear how an educator could see that future potential excellence in us at this point of ego, right? They're, they'd be looking for something that isn't what we are in what we are. Um, that's problematic. So the constitutive condition, condition contains these two existential implications, one that the educator can see and two that the student has something to be seen. So we're crossing out two because there's nothing in the student to be seen because what the student arrives at is without ego, without self, just bright sparks the fire of love, right? So if the exemplarist constitutive condition cannot rest upon two, for, for, for the foregoing reasons that it can only be viably defined by one, which is that the ed educator is constituted so as to have the ability to see potential excellences. But again, there's a problem. If a machine educator is merely constitutively defined as a sort of person who's able to recognize potential excellences, then anyone could be an educator, anybody, right? Anybody could be an exemplar. And Nietzsche doesn't want anybody to be an exemplar. Um, priests of Rizantamah, uh, scholars, people who are giant ears, uh, ascetics, these like enemies of the Nietzschean corpus, these people he um, lambasts and roasts and, and argues against and says, you're, uh, you're nihilists in a pretty dress, right? Um, these ones could be exemplars just insofar as they could see excellences in students, but that's not gonna be any good. So to save a form of the exemplarist view, we need a new constitutive condition to complete the picture and avoid this problem. So what makes the difference then between an educator and a Nietzschean bad guy, right? One of the, the enemies of the Nietzschean project. So here's where we get artistic interpretation and transfiguration. What sort of constitutive future can constrain the class of educators to those people who uh, one, meet the practical condition, meaning that they do inspire the twofold feeling uh, but are also pro not promulgators of sickness and nihilism, um, but rather of culture and of health, of strength. Hello. Artistic interpretation. So it's through artistic interpretation, the ability to artistically interpret someone that we're gonna be able to make this distinction. So we gotta learn what artistic interpretation is and how it works. So even the greats like Schopenhauer are human, and we get a lot of that in Schopenhauer's educator, that Nietzsche is like loving all over Schopenhauer, but throughout um, the essay, he says, look, the, the guy was just a man and, and he kind of sucked a lot of times. He um, was mean and, and angry and, and Schopenhauer was mean and angry. Um, he like married and then just got irritated with his wife and left and he like beat his like his drinking buddies all the time and, and nobody wanted to spend time with him. And uh, he, he had like no students. Um, all of his potential students were Hegel students at the time. Uh, and so he's super pissed at Hegel and um, yeah, had no friends, mean side Bernie guy. Um, so even though Schopenhauer is human and imperfect and whatever, um, he's still an educator for Nietzsche. And no human being can at the same time be both an ideal and a person. We're all, after all, after all we're all human, too human. Um, however, it's through artistic interpretation that it's possible to transfigure true exemplars into educators, right? To make the difference between um, a Nietzschean bad guy and a Nietzschean exemplar through artistic interpretation and transfiguration. So transfiguration is 
artistic interpretation is the modus operandi of transfiguration. It's through transfiguration that Schopenhauer the human becomes Schopenhauer the ideal exemplar and educator. So what's the definition? A person is a Nietzschean educator if and only if. Now I'm like given a definition. This is the linchpin of the argument, right? This is where it all hangs. One, this person's life is able to be valued through an artistic interpretation under which Two, the educator's life is not only transfigured as wholly firmable, but also under which three, the transfigured educator's life affirming value has interpretive power for the life of the educated person as well. Uh, and I'll talk about all of these conditions um, as we move on. So this is the definition. This is the new constitutive condition that I'm offering to tell us what counts as a, as a Nietzschean educator. So what is an artistic interpretation at all? Well, according to Nietzsche's account of artistry in the gay science, the gay science is um, a book all about art and interpretation. It's really cool. Uh, he wrote it when he was getting better from being really sick and it's a response to uh, French moralism um, and, uh, and yeah, deals with art and interpretation. Um, artists impose in this book, artists impose perspectives and interpretations upon the world that beautify it and redeem it, that make the ugly beautiful by looking at it in the right sort of way, by shining the right kind of light, by painting the picture with the right sorts of angles, right? So as he says in Gay Science 85, artists continually glorify all those states and things that are reputed to give man the opportunity to feel good for once or great or intoxicated or cheerful or well and wise. And in our ultimate gratitude to art, and there's some metaphorical similarity in what he's talking about here and what we read in Schopenhauer's Educator. As an aesthetic phenomenon, existence is still bearable for us, where it wouldn't be without an aesthetic uh, interpretation. And art furnishes us with eyes and hands and above all else, good conscious to be able to turn ourselves into just such a phenomenon. At times we need a rest from ourselves by looking upon, by looking down upon ourselves from an artistic distance laughing over ourselves or weeping over ourselves. We must discover the hero no less than the fool in our passion for knowledge. We should be able to, to also stand above morality and not only, not only to stand with the anxious stiffness of a man who's afraid of slipping and falling at any moment, but also to float above it and play. So again, we have this like above and below language. We have a standing above morality of, um, uh, atomistic values, uh, being able to laugh at ourselves, but not just to laugh at ourselves, but cry with ourselves, to feel, to live aesthetically, um, to be at once uh, aware of uh, where we're at, afraid of slipping on a precipice, hanging off the edge of suffering, of animalic uh, sadness, um, of suffering, uh, but also um, looking down on that person, standing high above us and um, offering a hand. Um, through uh, an aesthetic phenomenon of existence. So artistic interpretation in this spirit um, takes in all that is both foolish and glorifiable in us and represents it as aesthetic, as beautiful, and as redeemed. By taking ourselves to be an aesthetic phenomenon, as with the artist or a gay scientist, the foolish features of a life have a role to play in an artistic interpretation insofar is they contour and accent the heroic and glorifiable ones, right? The, the hunchback's hunch isn't a deformity, it's an opportunity, right? Um, just as the shadows in a photograph often provide as much character to its composition as does the light. So what is foolish is redeemed in virtue of what is heroic. And now to, to return to Atticus's point here, um, my interpretation of Nietzsche would likely be committed to um, uh, through an artistic interpretation, the ability to transfigure uh, things like white supremacy and, and awful, terrible things into like redeemable qualities. Um, yeah, yeah, like Nazism just becomes a fun plot point. I think my argument might be committed to that. I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it in that way. Um, and and I, I don't know how I would respond to that objection. Um, but I, I do want to like bring it back up and say at this point, that kind of objection would be like a really apt 
thing to to say like, hey, wait, this is a, can be a potential problem with the view. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll defer the the problem to future thought, but um, do want to recognize like that is a looming bullet to bite or dodge at this point. Okay, so. Significantly in Schopenhauer's educator, Nietzsche interprets Schopenhauer in just this way, what's foolish and human in him uh, as redeemable and a part of what makes the man so great, right? That he was an unfriendly, mean curmudgeonly cahoot of, a, of an old dude, uh, but this caused him to go live alone in the countryside to avoid the university, to avoid becoming a scholar himself, to have the inspiration he needed to write the beautiful things that he did. Um, uh, there, is it a quote here like Schopenhauer had a dog it's like talking about how life is suffering and, and everything sucks it's Schopenhauer um but then he keeps a dog and loves his dog his whole life so I think Nietzsche mentions that somewhere um so he's like a sad guy but still lives as if he's hopeful and full of life and joy anyways here's what he says of Schopenhauer and Schopenhauer's educator in the spirit as I'm making the claim of what he says about artistic interpretation in the gay science. Though this is a foolish and a modest way of putting it, I understand him, Schopenhauer, as though it were for me he had written. Thus it is, I never discovered any paradoxes in him, though here and there a little error. For what are paradoxes but assertions which carry no conviction, because their author himself is not really convinced of them, and makes them only so as to glitter and seduce, and in general, to cut a figure. Schopenhauer never wants to cut a figure, for he writes for himself, and no one wants to be deceived, least of all, the philosopher. That's high praise. And this is Nietzsche's first introduction of Schopenhauer in Schopenhauer's Educator. This is like the first moment that he mentions Schopenhauer after um, a bit of a, 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 like a couple of chapters on um, problem of nihilism, how to find ourselves in a lost world where we might feel lost. Um, what we need is an educator, says Nietzsche. And so he brings up Schopenhauer for the first time in this quote. And my clicker is really slow today. Nietzsche begins with an artistic interpretation and goes from there to develop his account of virtue or virtues as they inherit in this aesthetically beautified Schopenhauer under an artistic interpretation of Schopenhauer. And how this artistic interpretation of Schopenhauer causes that version, the one that Nietzsche has interpreted of Schopenhauer, to be transfigured and thus give him the twofold feeling. But again, we have the problem, right? This is the problem that we were trying to solve. Could artistically interpret, interpreted Schopenhauer be the same as artistically interpreted giant ear man? Could we just artistically interpret giant ear man all the way through? It's giant hair. hair man? Yeah, it's giant hair man. Sure. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, and I bet that was without product. <laughs> That's one of these. Yeah, my hair looks like that when I'm writing a lot. Um, so could we just not artistically interpret the, the scholar, the priest of Zantama, and get an educator out of them? So it's not enough that an educator be able to educate and inspire the twofold feeling through artistic interpretation alone. Any person, including aesthetics, uh, who Nietzsche didn't like, Nietzsche was a he hated asceticism because the ascetic denies life and tries to like meditate themselves out of it. And Nietzsche wants you to live life, to dance, to say yes, to exist, to be happy, to laugh, to cry, right? To exist. And priests of Rosantama who try to write over life and tell you that you're small and weak and that um, you'll have a perfect life uh, in, in the afterlife. So forget about this one here on earth, right? They, these people could be plausibly interpreted and redeemed in this way through artistic transfiguration. Um, not only must a life be redeemed under an artistic interpretation for that person to be an educator, but that life must also be transfigured by the art artistic interpretation. So here's where transfiguration becomes important. And I rely on another Nietzsche scholar's definition of transfiguration because um, yes, well, I mean, it depends on the kind of monk, but you might think of a monk as, as a kind of ascetic. Yeah, um, people who uh, hermitize themselves from life is the idea. So. I'm assuming Lanier Anderson's uh, account of transfiguration. Anderson says, for Nietzsche, redemption operates crucially through transfiguration. 
It affects a metamorphosis of particular features and events of a life, giving them a new form and a sense of a new significance and, eval and evaluative salience. So artistic interpretation therefore has two functions. Hello. Oh my God, I'm just gonna like do this now. Okay. Uh, artistic interpretation redeems the foolish features interpreted um, of the interpreted object through beautification. And it transfigures the redeemed object just so long as the interpretation is powerful enough to wholly metamorphose that object. So um, you, you redeem the foolish features and you also transfigure um, through artistic interpretation, through making uh, an object or a person as an aesthetic phenomenon, as Nietzsche says in the gay science. But what makes a redemptive interpretation, one that not only makes the foolish justified in, for the sake of the good um, interpretation, also transfigure that wholly metamorphose metamorphosizes, metamorphoses um, the object of transfiguration. Uh, the redemption, as I'm claiming, must be able to apply to every feature of a life categorically. You can't leave something out, you can't forget, you can't skim over. Um, and if a value cannot be ascribed, which redeems all that is foolish, then a life is not, able to be, not yet able to be transfigured and the person cannot act as our educator. They remain imperfect and contradictory in themselves. They cut a figure but Schopenhauer never cuts a figure, right? He writes for himself. So what if we make our lives or our educators' lives as the object to be artistically interpreted and beautified? If I could tell my life story, says Lanier Anderson here, in such a way that I will the whole, talking about eternal affirmation, then I could likewise affirm each event within it in virtue of its essential contribution to the meaning of the whole story. Thus events that were considered by themselves regrettable may be affirmed nonetheless. The new story of my life affords me a new attitude towards such fragments, which itself changes their import and so redeems and transfigures them. I thereby bring my life into greater harmony with my values and thus improve it in the dimension of Nietzsche's concern. So this is what a transfiguring interpretation does for um, the foolish features of our life. It makes them uh, affirmable, right? In the, the spirit of the eternal return. So can we distinguish through artistic interpretation, a true educator from a scholar, priest or zontaman aesthetic? Well, even though we may artistically interpret and thereby redeem priests of zontaman and scholars and aesthetics, these Nietzschean enemies, the value under which those sorts of lives would be redeemed would not also apply to every feature of that character's lives, right? Because they live sort of two-faced double lives. They think that they're doing what's great and strong and good, but then they become a giant ear and forget about the rest of their body. And so if you value them for what they value, then you also forget about the stock of a man attached to that ear, right? So the value under which those sorts of lives would become redeemed would not also apply to every feature, universally um, transfigure, universally make the foolish uh, into something that's strong, um, the figure of those characters' lives. They remain untransfigured, though redeemed in part. So nope, not an educator. The sorts of lives that could be redeemed, but still resist transfiguration, are predicated upon a kind of sickness that Nietzsche believes leads the world away from its possible alpine heights and instead to a vengeful nihilism. Yeah, um, I, I think Sarah's right here. The Nazi would cut a figure and be like the giant fist or something not transfigured. So the, the, I, I think this development is at least a response to particular cases of artistic interpretation and, and, and transfiguration for um, Atticus's objection, but I, think that this is not an answer to uh, life affirmation on the whole. So if it, life affirmation isn't just about my life, but about like encompassing all of existence, as much of existence as I can through the creation of a value that makes it all worth it. Um, that seems problematic for the same reasons that Ivan thought it was problematic at the loss of innocence, right? How can you justify any of this pain, even if you reinterpret it? Didn't the child still scream and cry, right? Um, no getting rid of that. So you might be able to, to say like, look, these particular cases can be transfigured or not, but can we like world historically redeem and, and transfigure? Uh, maybe we've uh, screwed ourselves a little bit too hard um, and committed a few too many atrocities, a few too many times, a few too, well, a little too terribly, very terribly. Um, so at least in particular cases, we can now distinguish so I claim, between educators 
uh, who are able to inspire the twofold feeling and uh, people who might be able to be artistically interpreted, but um, aren't able to inspire the fan, can't be transfigured, okay? So Zarathustra offers insight into redemption that fails to transfigure. Um, this is a passage I didn't have you guys read. Um, I think it happens earlier in book one, but I don't remember, I think the quote is coming up, that's book two. So he describes a sickly individual who applies an artistic interpretation of themselves. They try to like see themselves as um, valuable. They try to affirm their life, um, but they fail to be fully transfigured even though they are interpreting themselves artistically. Willing liberates. What means does the will devise for himself to get rid of his melancholy and to mock his dungeon? Alas, every prisoner becomes a fool and the imprisoned will redeems himself foolishly. Thus the will, the liberator took to hurting. And on all who can suffer, he wreaks revenge for his inability to go backwards. This indeed is what revenge is, that wills ill will against time and it was. So what is, that? this is a little cryptic, but we can work through it. Basically the idea is that there's a person who's sick and weak and not doing so great, but, or, or maybe hasn't done so great in the past. And what they're doing is they're interpreting, they're trying to redeem themselves, to think of themselves as, valuable as, as worth it as you know uh, being someone that they could be proud of being. And so what they do is they try to will liberation, but they don't look backwards. They only look at what they are and what they will become. They only have one half of the twofold feeling. They don't look backwards because that's where their sickness is, where their weakness is, these parts that they can't transfigure. And so they um, uh, don't look back. And um, so they, they seek out revenge on other people. They become priests of Rizontamal and, and all this stuff um, is, is sort of the effect. Uh, they inspire nihilism in others because they are unable to look back at themselves and transfigure themselves um, because they are too sickly and though in part redeemed, not transfigured. Okay. So like Schopenhauer is artistically interpreted, in, interpreted, interpreted in Schopenhauer's educator, Nietzschean educators are those sorts of people who can be transfigured through artistic interpretation, such that the eternal affirmation of their whole life, not just in the now and going forward, but also looking back, right? The eternal affirmation of their whole life is explainable in virtue of that interpretation's redeeming value. So we value, Nietzsche prescribes a value to Schopenhauer as Schopenhauer presents himself to Nietzsche. And this value um, makes it, it creates an artistic interpretation of Schopenhauer that transfigures him. And the transfiguration is because the value applies all the way forward through the idea of Schopenhauer and all the way back. It is a universal value that in every instance of uh, thinking about Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer is redeemed. And through this universal redemption of Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer is transfigured. And this transfiguration inspires in Nietzsche the twofold feeling because all of a sudden, well, there's a person who's like me that, that I'm, I see is like so great and good that was able to affirm all of their life, that was able to will the eternal return. Um, and uh, I can do that too. I see it as possible. It's that the uh, actuality of a possibility, that the possibility, a possibility become actualized as a possibility, right? To will the eternal return through our educators. And this much is again, made clear of Schopenhauer. As he says, no, Genius is now summoned, so that one may hear whether genius, the highest fruit of life, can perhaps justify life as such. The glorious creative human being is now to answer the question, do you affirm existence in the depths of your heart? Is it sufficient for you? Would you be its advocate, its redeemer? For you have only to pronounce a single heartfelt yes, and life, though it faces such heavy accusations, shall go free. So here's Nietzsche interpreting Schopenhauer as a life affirmer through an artistic interpretation that redeems what's foolish in him as strong that transfigures the life of Schopenhauer as someone who could affirm life. And whether or not Schopenhauer actually did, I think doesn't matter. What matters is that we're able to interpret someone's life as such. And then there's a recursive quality. It comes back to us. We see the possibility of life affirmation in our hero and so we can do it as well, okay? So we have a new constitutive condition. Again, I'm gonna repeat the definition. A person is a Nietzschean educator, if and only if 
Their life is able to be valued through an artistic interpretation under which that life is transfigured as wholly affirmable, but also under which that life affirming value through which the artistic interpretation makes the life an aesthetic phenomenon of transfiguration has an interpretive power that goes all the way forward and all the way back that fits the schematism of the eternal occurrence. And I call this person a hollow exemplar. They're not just an exemplar because of what they are, but they're sort of hollow in this way because it's not so much about what they are as what you're able to interpret into them. If you are able to, to interpret and transfigure a life of a person so that that person's life could be eternally affirmable, then that's all it takes to, to get inspired with a twofold feeling. And you know, Schopenhauer may not have actually seen that in himself, but uh, he, uh, never tried to cut a figure and always wrote for himself and for Nietzsche that was enough to, um, well, that and a whole lot else was enough to make it work for him. So the interpreter, the student, is the one who sees the educator's life, the whole life, as transfigured as Nietzsche saw Schopenhauer's life. And the application of a transfiguring artistic interpretation likewise gives the interpreter insight into a beautifying value that she sees as valuable for her own life. It's an interpreter's value that makes someone's life wholly affirmable. Not my own value, but the person interpreting me. Not Schopenhauer's own value, but Nietzsche interpreting him. Thus, the interpreter is able to see what it would be like to beautify a whole life, to say yes to every moment with a value that they see as valuable. And it's in virtue of this realization that the student experiences the twofold feeling under their interpretation of their exemplar figure, just as Nietzsche did for Schopenhauer uh, in this essay and probably for Wagner in person. Thus only he who has attached his heart to some great man receives thereby the first consecration of culture. And we didn't read this part. This, is, this comes after what I signed. The sign of that consecration is that one is ashamed of oneself without any accompanying distress. That one has a feeling of sympathy for the genius who again and again drags himself up out of our dryness and apathy with the profoundest conviction that everywhere nature is succeeding in producing the most marvelous beginnings, individual traits and forms, so that the men we live among resemble a field over which is scattered the most precious fragments of sculpture where everything calls to us. Come, assist, complete, bring together what belongs together. We have an immeasurable longing to become whole. Awesome, right? Just Nietzsche being a boss. So when an interpreter artistically transfigures an educator, she will experience the twofold feeling. She'll at once see the value, uh, the valuation of a life that's wholly beautified, that's transfigured through artistic interpretation. Um, and if we are able to take all of the pieces of the sculpture of a life and put them together and construct a beautiful work of art, and we see that, then we reflect on ourselves and we think, how do I put myself together, right? And, and there's this quote at the very beginning of, of, um, of Schopenhauer's Educator where we get this described to us. Um, Let the youthful soul look back on life with the question, what have you truly loved up to now? What has drawn your soul aloft? What has mastered it and at the same time blessed it? Set up these revered objects before you and perhaps their nature and their sequence will give you a law, the fundamental law of your own true self. Compare these objects with one another. See how one completes, expands, surpasses, transfigures another. How they constitute a stepladder upon which you have clambered up to yourself as you are now. For your true nature lies not concealed deep within you but immeasurably high above you or at least above that which you usually take yourself to be. Your true educators and formative teachers reveal to you that the true original meaning and basic stuff of your nature is something completely incapable of being educated or formed, and is in any case something difficult of access, bound and paralyzed. Your educators can be your only liberators. So awesome. <laughs> I love that. And, and what, what I read there is this process happening, that we are inspired by our educators when we can give a value that becomes the glue that brings that life all together. And then we look back at our own, at all of our activities, our goals, our ends, our aims, the things that made us happy, we find the principle of those. And we let that be our guiding light forward. We 
find a value that lives in all of those pieces. And we try to glue ourselves together so that we can rise up to not what lives deep within, but what we reach towards high above. So we can now construct a, a new form of Nietzsche's exemplar as it appears in Schopenhauer's Educator and in his later work. It's a hollow exemplarism, not an exemplarism straight up. Neither educators nor students necessarily have any already existentially realized excellences deep in them, right? But educators can be constitutionally defined as those individuals whom students may transfigure under an artistic interpretation. Educators are exemplars within a transfiguring perspective. Hence, exemplars are hollow insofar as they do not necessarily have any predetermined categorical excellences, atomistic values that make them what they are. We bring them to bear in the interpretation of our heroes, our teachers, our educators, our exemplars, the saint, the philosopher, and the hero but rather have the capacity to inspire the twofold feeling in virtue of their ability to be artistically transfigured by the student. The end. Okay. So Sarah says the self seems aspirational, although there's no essence. It's made by the self through an optimistic view of what it could be. Yeah. Uh, the self seems aspirational. Um, it, yeah, I, I think... Um, it is until you actually get there and then it ceases to feel, you cease to remember the word I. And so there's an interesting kind of experience of um, ego death and complete life affirmation, something maybe. For someone who said we've killed God, this seems like a born again Christian pitch. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting take. Um, so I'm gonna stop the share and Make it gallery view. Take my screenshot. I don't know. I didn't do it fast enough. Oh, it's so hard. I gotta like mouse over. This is like an opportunity to turn on your cameras. Oh, got it. Okay. Cool. So that's that's my reading of like all of Nietzsche, right? So what what I do in the argument is uh, take the biggest problem of nihilism and the biggest goal of life affirmation and try to make how to live a life through from a, a perspectivist um, point of view possible. So, so again, hopefully the goal was to like give you guys a story of everything so that when you look back and you see these things, you can start to reconstruct a story for yourself. And this is just mine. And controversial and relies on a bunch of controversial interpretations of Nietzsche and whatnot. So um, don't take this as the end all be all, but um, now that we're at the end, uh, what do we think? Do we have questions, objections? Quentin. Yeah, do exemplars necessarily need to be, I, I guess the opposite of uh, you know, an inverse cripple, which would, I'm not going to say it's a cripple, but maybe someone who's authentic and embraces their humanity then. Is that necessary for an educator to be authentic under this interpretation? Um, uh, so uh, maybe. Uh, I, I think uh, under my interpretation, I would object to there being such a thing as authentic. Okay, but you would. I guess we'll maybe, maybe authenticity is the value that uni unifies the life. Right. Okay. Okay. If authenticity is like the opposite of the two facedness of the of the creeds or the ascetics, then yes. So if authenticity, if by that you mean um, a stand-in for whatever uh, can make the life wholly valuable and eternally affirmable, worth living over and over, um, then yeah, totally. That would be the difference. Okay. Two participants raise their hand. Let's do Atticus and then Scott. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh-huh. Uh, I guess I'm just wondering if we can disregard a person's life and make them into this like hollow sort of being. Uh, do they even like need to necessarily be a real person? And I guess this like maybe plays into the like the Jesus story, but I mean, separate point there, but couldn't we just like make up characters and like whoever to be our exemplars if they don't need to have like 
any inside bits if they can just see these hollow figures? Uh, yeah, I think I'd be committed to that uh, in my interpretation of Nietzsche. So um, Nietzsche never met Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer was dead before Nietzsche was around. Uh, and, and so like authors of the past, they become characters, right? That we don't share lived experience with them. Um, and yet Nietzsche is using Schopenhauer, not Wagner, right? It, which might be kind of a significant difference. He's not talking about a real life person that is transfiguring him, which might be a little uh, simpy, right? For Wagner. <laughs> and and he, he already was like a lot anyways. So that might've been like laying it on a little too thick, but um, I, yeah, I mean, like if I'm right, it may just not be a problem for Nietzsche that like a fictional character could be the sort of person that um, inspires the twofold feeling. Um, yeah. So then it would be enough to say that the person had the twofold feeling and not that they actually had it. The, does that make the educator? Had like the, they don't necessarily need to have the twofold. Feeling. Oh yeah, no, no. They just need to be able to inspire it or, or like have a life such that it can be transfigured through an artistic interpretation by a student that inspires in the student the twofold feeling. So the, the educator kind of like, it doesn't matter is what I'm claiming. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, Scott. Thank you. Um, in philosophy of science, we have Thomas Kuhn, who uses the term exemplar, and it's a little bit cynical, um, where exemplars are essentially a, a means of, of brainwashing new scientists into uh, uh, the paradigm into a paradigm. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious about, and maybe this can be for discussion board, or if you know any further readings about the idea of you know, I get a little bit hesitant at, oh, I'm going to look to this person and I'm going to use them as an example, as that's kind of giving them a lot of power. Sure. And if my interpretation is wrong the, and they aren't necessarily worthy of that, that's pretty dangerous, actually. Yeah, that's totally right. And and I think uh, this is why it's important to have the the power of the exemplar be provided by the student rather than by the exemplar themselves. So that like thus the hollow exemplarism kind of thing. And, and that is what um, allows me to distinguish between a, a Nietzschean educator and a Nietzschean bad guy, right? So the, the exemplar scientists um, who perform all sorts of cognitive brainwashing and confirmation bias on their graduate students uh, and cause a paradigm to become even more concretized in the uh, uh, scientific zeitgeist of a department or maybe just like across the universities um, would be like a person with a giant ear, the, the sort of person that we don't want to take to be an exemplar. Um, and if we're following in their footsteps, then not only are we uh, uh, bootstrapping someone else's value uh, and rather than creating our own, um, but we're also uh, bootstrapping a value that's not so great. So it's, it's a value that doesn't make the world totally life affirmable. It doesn't do like what Kant might call like the pure science um, uh, of reasoning or whatever, um, because we would get stuck in a particular scientific paradigm and uh, think that that paradigm is what uh, reveals or determines truth, even though it, it has its own mistakes that we just refuse to see, right? So that is problematic. And, and Nietzsche would, I think, probably agree with Kuhn that, um, those kinds of uh, lock-ins to scientific um, theories, methods, and beliefs uh, are just like another way to have a giant ear and a really strong will of truth. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see, there's other comments. Uh, Sarah, is the final ego death unifying with the universals of life on a basic level or also on a kind of idealistic concept of life? Can you say more about that, Sarah? Um, okay. I'm sorry, I, I've moved on from there, but which, uh, I didn't, the, uh, well, I was thinking about the authenticity of the educator. Um, uh, you're saying the final ego death unifying with universals. Yeah. Um, I just wondered about this final ego death, if it 
if it's very idealistic about if it's a kind of transcendent idealistic almost like a spiritual sense of connection with all being just in, thinking in religious traditions and you know if it's a, a kind of a, a universal connection with all being but without a sense of soul or spirit but it being just the spark of life thing it's just interesting yeah. it's, it's so close it's like the spark of life and the spark of fire it sounds so spiritual <laughs> but um I just wondered how to what context to view that in this connect this ego death in connection with with all life is that kind of a, a universal unity a unifying with all life all being I'm, I'm just need con context for that idea. Um, I'm not sure I can answer your question, I, I think it's a highly interpretable phrase and it is early in the Nietzsche corpus and career. Um, but yeah, I mean I kind of read it as sort of universal transfiguration spirit ego death kind of thing um it's it is just like a strongly poetic phrase though and so it it is open to multiple interpretation um i'm looking for the page with the quote and i can't find it um but, but yeah i mean it's it's um as with all of nietzsche it, you can take his metaphors and read them in any which way. And uh, I've chosen to read them in a way that uh, makes sense to me. And, you know, like that, that unifies the expression with the other things that I read in Nietzsche, which would be sort of like a having, uh, at least being in parallel with a sort of spiritualism. So Atticus also says, looks nervously at the sea of internet takes, leaving it all up to the student also seems big risky. Yeah, I think so too. Um, if the student is doing it improperly or um, not actually like, like thinking that they are having an experience of the twofold feeling, but it's not actually in, in genuine or whatever, that's a problem and not so great. Um, and so everybody should read Schopenhauer's Educator so that they don't make that mistake. There you go, you're all saved, great. <laughs> um, cool, so it's been an hour and 50 minutes, which is a long time. I think we'll call it. Uh, no, nobody here is sticking around for the reading. Are you Scott, no? Or, uh, um, so um, is anybody online? gonna do reading group today part two of no okay let me end the recording at least